Good morning. We'll start in a, a few minutes uh, as everybody has the time to join in. Uh, so uh, bear with us for a second, please. Okay. Good morning. I'm Mandeep Connell, Director of Results Washington. I'm honored to welcome all of you to our 11th annual Washington State Lean Transformation Conference. I'm so glad you are here. Our theme for the conference is results happen together. This conference is the outcome of our governor's vision of ensuring all Washington State employee have access to lean and continuous improvement learnings so that they can continue to provide a gold standard of service to all Washingtonians. Our goal is to provide you with a variety of tools and techniques of various disciplines under continuous improvement umbrella. This year, we have also scheduled more opportunity to learn about the great work agencies are doing on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Before we get started, let me walk us through a few housekeeping details. If I lose connection for any reason, my colleague, John Cooper, Deputy Director at Results Washington, will take over as a host for this session. We have ESL interpretation today and real-time real captioning is also available. On the toolbar, there are icons for chat and Q&A. We are using chat to share any materials, but chat between participants and Q&A is not available. If you need technical assistance, please email results at gov.wa.gov and my team will do our best to help you. Finally, at the end of session, a survey will appear. Please take the time to complete this survey. This will provide us with a meaningful feedback about your meeting experience. Again, on the behalf of entire Results Washington team, we are so excited and honored to be able to continue offering this learning opportunity this year. It is our third time delivering conference remotely, and we are excited about this year's offering. This conference has evolved from in-person to fully virtual and from lean only focus to include other disciplines under the continuous improvement umbrella over the last three years. And that is a testament to our commitment to adapt to changing times and to stay focused on our journey of continuous improvement in Washington state. In selecting this year's offering, we have asked our presenters to keep three things in mind. Number one, we asked them to provide concrete tools and methods that participants can readily apply to their work. Number two, we ask them to provide learnings that can be applied with hybrid and remote work environments to meet current and future realities. And number three, we ask them to provide learnings that support our commitment to advancing diversity, equity, inclusion in Washington state. Next, we have Governor Jay Inslee with us. Uh, thank you, Governor, for being with us today. And I will turn it over to you for your opening remarks. Thank All right, you. Mandeep, thank you. Thanks for your leadership of this results group. We know we believe in uh, lean and continuous improvement, and it's just a joy to be able to have so many thousands of people on us to talk about how to continue that work. You know, I really look forward to these meetings. This is our 11th uh, uh, lean conference, and they continue to grow in people's interest because I think they've seen the success that we have had, and we've had a lot of success in Washington. You know, just if you reflect on the last year in Washington State, some of the good things have happened. Uh, Washingtonians have launched the first uh, uh, all-electric new airplane, a nine-seater, flew over at Moses Lake uh, the other day. Uh, Seattle Mariners just played in the, the longest 
uh, tied for the longest playoff game. We know they're going to be back in spring training. By the way, I want to congratulate everyone on this call. We checked. No one uh, stopped watching that game all the way through the 18th uh, inning. So thanks for the persistence of Washingtonians. Um, uh, the Inslees have welcomed a new grandchild and went on their way next month. Uh, and we continue to lead the country in so many ways. We've been ranked as uh, the third best place to work, the second best place to do business. And U.S. News and World Report uh, just uh, recently announced that we're overall the best state in the United States. So we have a lot to be proud of. Now, of course, we're also the most humble state in the United States. Uh, but we, uh, we continue to have aspirations to continue to improve. And, and that's the nature of what we're talking about here is how do we wring out the last ounce, the last mile of improvement so we can deliver services to Washingtonians. And, and I think that uh, we're doing that in, in ways big and small. And by the way, let me mention some of the small things. One of the things about a continuous improvement that I think it's important to note is that, that you make improvements sometimes in what you might consider smaller steps. I was reading a book about a polar explorer, a Norwegian, a guy named Frida Nansen. And he, uh, on his journeys, he would reduce the weight of his sled that he had to pull by, you know, half an ounce here and there. And that's how he made it, um, uh, you know, and survived. It's these small improvements and the things we're going to talk about today, some may not be seem like we're going to the moon, but you, you put them together and you improve performance and services for Washingtonians. And everybody on this call has an opportunity to do that. So I'm encouraged what we've uh, achieved already. I want to talk about how we've been able to do it. First, through the use of technology, you know, we're demonstrating this right now. We've got 67,000 state employees. 34,000 live outside of Thurston and King County. We now using technology, this technology, uh, are able to get more people uh, involved to use technology to have uh, access. Uh, uh, you know, our correctional facilities and our, our courts have learned how to open up to be able to have, uh, uh, you know, hearings uh, remotely. And we figured out the process to be able to do that. Congratulations to everyone always looking for that way to use new technology to make us uh, more connected. And I know we're going to continue uh, on that journey. Uh, but uh, the theme of this today is results happen together. And I think collaboration is key to our continuing on this journey. You know, and that's a challenge, right? In any organization, being able to collaborate across agencies, across organizations, across uh, you know, organizational structures is always a challenge. But I think when I look at the success we've had in Washington, it most frequently is because we have found a way to get out of our silos and, and collaborate. And I know that that's happened um, in, in many ways. Let me just list a few ways where people have worked together. You know, during the pandemic, we obviously had a crush of, of uh, claims for uh, uh, unemployment insurance uh, through the Employment Security Department. And I'm proud that our, uh, our Office of Administrative Hearings collaborated with our Employment Security Department to create a streamlined way to find sort of a fast channel to get faster results of appeals. And they were able to uh, resolve 3,000 cases uh, in just one quarter alone using this accelerated uh, way. And they reduced their appeals backload by 25% in five months. Now that's a big deal to Washingtonians because if you're waiting to get your appeal resolved, uh, this is obviously important in people's uh, ability to pay their rent, to reduce that backload by 25% is a huge thing for people's lives. To me, you know, to some degree it's a number, but it means Washingtonians can get service faster, they can get resolution, they can go on with their lives. That's a big achievement and it happened because we had people willing to pick up that phone, get the text, go across an agency, and work together to find an accelerated uh, result. Congratulations. I look at um, our Department of Financial Institutions. Um, they work with the Department of Commerce and with the Washington Housing Finance Commission and the Department of Licensing 
to get more homeowners to, to realize that they can be eligible for down payment assistance. We know that this is a big deal in Washington. A, a huge part of our economic disparity is the lack of home ownership and, and getting that down payment we know in a rising home market is really important. And because these four agencies work together, it resulted in 23,500 mortgage loan originators and 44,700 real estate brokers have received resources about how you actually get down payment assistance. Obviously the first step, you gotta, you gotta know about the program to start. And that awareness of an existing program I know is gonna make a difference in people's lives. Get that down payment, get home equity, get on that, that track that we know is so important from an equity standpoint in our society. Again, it happened because we had had hardworking, ambitious state employees willing to call someone else their colleagues in a different agency. That's the kind of work that, that we, want, uh, we want to see. Now, so technology, collaboration, the third concept I was thinking of is basic communication. The longer I'm in this business, the more that I learn that uh, the key to our success is frankly information sharing and communication. And now we're seeing new innovation in that regard. Uh, I'm really proud the Department of Health really uh, bore down on the need for accessible in language and culturally appropriate COVID-19 uh, messages. And this was a big emphasis for them to make sure that our communication was accessible to people. It's one of the reasons we've had relative success in fighting COVID. We know we've mourned all our losses but we know that our fatality rate is one of the lowest in the nations. You know, we may have saved 19,000 lives in our state with the work that we jointly did against COVID. Every one of those lives was precious to us. And our, our agencies wanted to really focus to make sure that we shared information and that it got to the right places. Uh, they grew from 48 funded community partners because they wanted to get community partners that understood the culture and understood the networks to over 200. We reached 52 communities, 44.4 million people in 92 different languages. That's one of the reasons we've saved a lot of lives in Washington state. Uh, now, we talked about something that I hope is in our DNA by this point, and that's our need for diversity, inclusion, and equity. And I think we are well on our way to making sure that is in our in our DNA. And I know we need to be innovative to do that. Look, we're we're trying to break out of old systems of century of, of inequity in our society. So it, it takes it takes new innovation to do that. I look at the Department of Enterprise Services, it's been a leader on this. Uh, they've uh, established a pilot program to improve equity and statewide contracting. We want to bring in talent of people who, who do contracts with the state, obviously. And they have this pilot project to get more people in that pipeline. And uh, their efforts resulted in 74% of vendors in this pilot program being awarded uh, to small, diverse, or veteran-owned contractors. That is a big deal to get people, uh, particularly small businesses, in the pipeline, it's good for them, and it's good for the state of Washington as well to have uh, more multiple talented people doing business with the state of Washington. That's just, and they succeeded because they looked at our recommendations from our disparity study and they used 11 of the 12 recommendations. So today, as you share your ideas, we know they work if we share a good idea. We look at the Office of Education Ombuds which are now providing assistance in 20 language. We're, we're, we're uh, adding two more. Dari and Pashto are going to be added uh, this year. The Healthcare Authority launched its health equity inventory. Uh, that allows a tool to really uh, assess how we're doing on our diversity and equity and, and inclusion. All of these things have used lean management. All of them started because we expected ourselves to always continue to improve and all of them have worked because we've collaborated across multiple agencies, used technology, improved our communications, and be proud of our operational performance. I want to just make this kind of point. You know, the kind of work we're talking about today, you're not going to be in the headlines. 
And nobody in this call is going to win the Nobel Peace Prize or, or write a book about the work we've done. It's, it's, this is the kind of work you do frequently in the back room. And I hope you take pride in what it results in, which is better lives for Washingtonians. So I know you're doing this work. You know you're doing this work. And, and I hope you're taking pride in the continued improvements we need that we're making in people's lives. We don't know some of these people, you know, when you help somebody get a unemployment check in a more timely fashion, when you, when you help a person get a down payment for a home, we don't know their names, but we know they're there. And I hope you take pride in, in, in the difference you're making in people's lives by improving the operations in your performance, because I know that that is happening. So uh, in summary, I wanna thank you for the work you're doing. I know you're gonna continue to elevate our, our, your colleagues. I know you're gonna continue to encourage your colleagues, even when we come up with an idea that doesn't reach fruition. I think one of our uh, talents or one of our skill sets is helping all of us, even though we propose things that don't make it to the finish line, but we're always trying to bubble these ideas because we know a bunch of them uh, are gonna work. So I hope you feel empowered by this conference. I hope you feel enabled. I hope you feel uh, prideful of the work you're doing and let's continue uh, uh, making Washington the best place in the country to live. I believe it is. We wanna continue that number one ranking. So let's go get them. Thanks very much. Thank you, Governor, for your support. We appreciate you and very fortunate to have your unwavering support. And thank you for acknowledging all the good work being done by the state agencies here in Washington. Celebrating achievement is an important and inspiring step for improvement journey. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Go get them. <laughs> the support and partnership from Washington State Agency leaders and continuous improvement practitioner over the years has been a key to fostering continuous improvement culture. Regardless of your experience with lean and continuous improvement, I invite you to take a full advantage of the offerings over the next two weeks. It takes a village to run this conference. With that in mind, I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to all of our presenters and volunteers who have generously volunteered their time and expertise to make this conference possible. And don't forget, you can directly donate to Combined Fund Drive this year. By directing your donations to Combined Fund Drive, you are supporting programs that make a difference and strengthen communities in many different ways. I think you can tell that I'm really excited to bring this conference to you today. We had a tremendous response with over 4,300 people registered for this conference. It is a choose your own adventure that is a mindful of people's time. We have a tremendous agenda filled with many different disciplines from continuous improvement umbrella. We would ask you to do a few things. Take your learning back to your teams, talk about what you have learned with your colleagues and try something new. And if you are in a position to affect and build that safe and supportive environment for the people to debrief on their learnings and to think about the ways to apply their learning to their work. And now, without a further ado, I would like to introduce you to our keynote presenter, Dr. Dean Schroeder. Dr. Schroeder is an award-winning author, consultant, and scholar. His work focuses on creating high-performing organizations and improving people's work lives through the application of better management. As a consultant and speaker, Dr. Schroeder has worked with many types of companies and organizations in North America, Europe, and Asia. We are very truly lucky to have Dr. Schroeder volunteer his time to be our keynote speaker. Dr. Dean Schroeder, stage is yours, sir. Thank you, Mandy. I really appreciate the opportunity to keynote uh, the 11th, the 11th Lean Transformation Conference. I don't know how many of you know this, but as near as I can figure out, and I've looked at a lot of them, is Washington State's conference is the oldest continuously running program in government on continuous improvement. And it was the beginning, it led early on what we have tracked as an increasing interest and increasing activity on lean, on continuous improvement in government. It's kind of exciting to see. 
The other thing that's nice is, especially now that it's virtual, I mean, it used to pull in people from all over the world and especially all over the United States, but now, now that it's open, it's pulling in an even larger group. Now, a couple of things I wanna point out. One of the things I'm gonna be focusing on today is um, one of the largest studies ever undertaken on continuous improvement in government. It was a six year study that we just completed and just published um, the book, book for. I'm gonna start sharing my slides. Um, if, they don't, if they don't come out right, um, whoops, something happened there. Uh, share, share. Okay, I apologize. I screwed something up here. Ha. Technology is wonderful until you screw it up. Um, any thoughts from the uh, tech experts? Uh, Dr. Schroeder, maybe we can click at the bottom, like where the presentation style is, these four icons, right where the sizing scroll is. There we go. Let's stop sharing. Now let's share. Did that not, is, is that not sharing? It is sharing, but it's not in a presentation mode. So if we go at the very oh, that's, bottom. That's, that's, that's fine. That's fine. We can, we can okay. handle that. Great. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to point out a couple of things, if we tie into what the government, the governor just shared, uh, it's almost as if he looked at the results of our study. A couple of things that I'd like to point out. Uh, results happen together. What we'd like to say is transformation happens together. It's actually more than just results that you can get. It's 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 entire transformation of a of an organization is 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 very possible. And we'll show you and some examples. Another thing that he talked about is small steps. Small steps. That was one of the keys that we're going to get into. Collaboration is key. We got to work across boundaries and with our colleagues. And we'll also talk about how what we found helps diversity and the many tools you need. Okay. Um, what's the difference? One of the things that pulled us into this study started about eight years ago. And by the way, Results Washington was one of our first, uh, the first places we went and studied what was going on. Uh, and that was eight years ago. So it was pretty early in the Results Washington lean transformation. But what was different about continuous improvement in government? You know, government borrows a lot of stuff from the industry, from the private sector. And when we started getting asked by more government people, we started wondering, well, do we want to just take what we learn in the private sector and move it into government? And the answer was, well, in the past, when we've done that, it hasn't been quite as good. The results haven't been as good as we had hoped. So we decided to take a look at this, find out what really works in government, what doesn't, and why. Why what works works and why what doesn't work doesn't work. So we started what ended up being a six-year study, 77 government units in five different countries. We studied them longitudinally over these six years, over a thousand interviews, and we contrasted high and low performers. What was the difference? What was the difference in the government agencies, the government organizations, the government units, the government teams that performed well in continuous improvement and those that did okay or, or, or struggle, or struggle? Well, once not, not surprisingly, we found some of the things that work in business also work in government, but some need to be modified and still others don't work well. There are some surprising tools that are common in the business side that don't work nearly as well in government. And we'll, get into, we'll look at why, why is that? Well, first of all, government has a different role, doesn't it? It's got a different mission. Everything isn't bottom line financial. Financial is important to deliver what we deliver in government, but what we deliver in government is so much different, so much more important, so much more complicated. Unique checks and balances in government. 
you know, you got a nice hierarchy in theory, but you got a lot of different uh, silos, a lot of different organizations trying to pull together in government or in business. When the boss says something, he or she usually has the authority to make it happen. In government, it takes a little more, it's a little more uh, complicated. Uh, my more diverse constituents. Can you imagine a more diverse constituents than the state of Washington? When you look across it, we're not only talking about diversity, we're talking about wealth, I mean, just everyone. Nature of leadership is different. Elected leadership instead of uh, um, leadership that worked their way through the uh, organization. Different structure, culture, workforce, a lot of things that are different. You guys can come up with more reasons than I can, having worked in government, that this is not a business. So we can't take everything for granted. Now, let's look at our some of our findings. One of our first findings that echoes what the governor was talking about is, we found that the real action, the real movement was happening on the front lines with lower tier leaders and frontline employees working together were the, driving for, were the ones driving improvement in the high performing companies. Can you imagine this? It's not the governor, it's not the middle managers, it's not the technical experts, it's the guys on the bottom. It's the guys, the guys and gals on the bottom. Kind of surprising. And what they were doing that was with a lot of small incremental changes, a lot of small incremental improvements, the type of thing which we can come up with every day. We'll get into the power of that a little bit in a little bit and, and how that works. But let's look at an example. Let's start out by looking at one example. I'm going to start out with an example from Denver licensing, Denver Excise and Licensing, one of our favorite examples, which we've studied over eight years now. Um, what they had is when, when Stacy Lauchs was appointed to her position by the mayor, Mayor, mayor Hancock, Mayor Michael Hancock, uh, she walked into the office and the air conditioner couldn't keep up. It was 85 degrees and the air conditioner couldn't keep up because there were so many people waiting in line for licenses. Denver license issues about 70 different licenses ranging from, um, merchant guard licenses, in other words, security guard licenses to uh, restaurant and liquor licenses. So a wide variety of different licenses, including uh, you know, eight different marijuana licenses. But it's, it's pretty complicated and, and, and they're waiting in line. Well, the average wait time turned out to be an hour and 40 minutes with peak times of eight hours, if you can imagine waiting in line for eight hours to, to renew an annual license, what a pain. Well, they went to work, they pulled in, uh, Melissa Field was seconded from Peak Academy, which was their, their equivalent of Results Washington. And they got it down to less than seven minutes. A couple of years later, when we went back, it was down to nothing. I was in there a couple of weeks ago. There was nobody. There was nobody because they loosened up their their uh, they 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 loosened up the stress point of those long waits, so they were able to put people on transforming a lot of their stuff to online and using new technologies, and so it's totally transformed a different thing. And they did it primarily with small employee ideas, little things, little things. We'll get into one or two of those in a minute, but before we that go go there, I want to go close to home. I want to go close to home. This is the Washington State Patrol. Yes, your guys that uh, fix up and, uh, and convert uh, automobiles into police cruisers, into patrol, patrol vehicles. They had a problem a number of years ago. They had a problem a number of years ago. The average retirement mileage for patrol vehicles was over 150,000 miles. Can you imagine that? Police cars running around the highways, patrol cars running around the highways with 150,000 miles on, on them. You can imagine performance issues, maintenance issues, safety issues, lots of issues. Well, what had happened was there had been a financial problem, financial short-term financial crunch in the state. And so uh, they cut back on capital expenditures for a couple of years. And one of the things they did is they cut back on purchases of new cars to be converted to patrol cars, new vehicles. 
Well, once the crunch was over, they bought the extra vehicles they needed. But what happened? What happened? They could only convert them at a certain speed. How do you convert more vehicles to patrol cars without increasing the size of the garage or its workforce? Sure, we could throw money at it, throw money at it, make a big new garage, increase the size. Then once they caught up, what would happen? We'd be overextended. We'd have extra money, extra, extra money tied up in, uh, in a bigger garage and more employees that we didn't need. So what happened? They had a three-year backlog of vehicles. Can you imagine a three-year backlog of vehicles sitting out in Washington State climate? Some of it was getting mold on it. Can you imagine new cars with mold on it? Well, they could, the average conversion rate at the time was 12 vehicles per month. They had to get this up. They had to get this up. Well, fortunately, there was an opportunity. Uh, Boeing had volunteered some lean training time from their lean trainers. And so the person in charge, the, the, the chief in charge of the um, fleet said, I want those people to help the state police garage. So they did. And um, coming out of the week of training, uh, they had a whole list. They had created the, 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 the installers had created a whole list of improvements they wanted to make. And they set a vision of getting to 20 car, converting 20 cars per month in two and a half years. That's an 80%, 67% uh, uh, improvement. What they actually did, however, was they hit 36 cars per month. That's a threefold, 300% improvement in productivity through lean, through little ideas, through continuous improvement. The retirement mileage dropped to 110,000 miles. Now, the question is, how did they do it? They did it, like I was saying, through little ideas. Let's look at a couple of samples. Let's look at a couple of samples. These are things that you can imagine they came up with. First of all, what they had before was the parts department serviced the mechanics as well as the converter, the, the installers the people that were installing and, and changing the new uh, vehicles to police cars. Well, so they had a checklist of the parts you needed. They had a checklist for the mechanic side that were fixing and routine maintenance. They had a checklist, the same checklist was used for the other side, which was converting vehicles. Didn't make sense. So what they did was they just pre-kitted everything instead of having wait for parts come in and maybe checking the wrong thing. They pre-kitted everything, put it on a cart, and so all you had to do was roll it out when you needed to uh, start a new vehicle. Everything was there. Everything was put in a proper place, nice and smooth, cut down on paperwork. The other thing they did is they organized the keys. Can you imagine five, three years of keys thrown in a cabinet? Well, that's what you had. You have to go through these keys. Well, they just organized the keys. Rocket science? Of course not. Anyone can come up with that type of information, that type of idea. Simple idea, but it changed. Save times. They organized the keys, and now when you've got a work order, you got the key. The other thing they did is they queued the vehicles next that were going to be worked on next, right next to the garage. Can you imagine getting a work order that has a VIN number going out into a lot with three, four hundred identical cars and trying to find that VIN number, that was part of the problem they were facing. And so they were wasting a lot of time. Now it was just queued up, they were ready to go. Templates, instead of trying to measure where every detail decal went when they put the state decal and all the locals on the doors and things, they just put a magnetic template there, put everything in nice and quick. That idea, by the way, very straightforward, spawned a whole bunch of ideas. So when they had to drill a hole, they just put a template there, put the hole in, whatever change they needed. Wire harnesses, this was an interesting one. Every installer strung more than 50 wires connecting computers, connecting light bars, connecting everything, radios, everything to the car. And everyone did it a little bit differently. So if there was a problem and another installer had to fix it, he didn't know how it was 
put together. Plus, it took a great deal of time. Somebody came up an idea, with an idea, say, what if we just bought, bought wire harnesses, where we worked with a supplier to set them up. So we just put in one wire harness. If you know what a wire harness is, it's, it's, it, it's a bundle of wires with all the right lengths and connections and just plug it in. That was a, that was a, a big, big time saver. Uh, brackets with pre-drilled holes, laser measuring seat covers, so you didn't have to take the back seat out and store it, put in a plastic seat. You could now just cover the existing seat with a custom plastic. All kinds of small ideas, all kinds of changes in the process. And the net result is um, they took care of their backlog in, uh, in a couple of years. But you know what? It didn't stop there. Remember, we're talking about continuous improvement. It didn't stop there. What did they do when they caught up? They celebrated and said, we're me. It went back to the way things were. No, no. What they did is now you have to remember they've been converting cars. What happens to the cars they get in? They have to be decommissioned. They can't sell police cars with lights and, and sirens and, and um, all the gear on it. They have to take that off. Now, because they've been busy trying to convert, they had four years of cars to convert out there. So they put their lean effort on retire, four years of retired vehicles needing decommissioning. I know this picture is a little old, but I thought it would be more fun than, uh, than, a, than, a, than a newer vehicle. But they had to convert these old vehicles. Now, what happened with that? What happened was rather interesting. They found while they were taking things apart, they found better ways to install them in the first place that made pulling them out easier. So it made the whole process, not just the decommissioning process, better as they started looking at decommissioning. The other thing that happened is all of a sudden with newer police cars, they were able to, and with all these decommissioned vehicles, they were all of a sudden able to sell them. They had an influx of cash into the state. But not only that, with the lower mileage vehicles, some of the police cars could be sold as police cars. Some of the patrol cars could be sold to local police departments uh, that did not put high mileage on their vehicles. For example, a number of um, college police, university police departments were buying the used cars without having to decommission. So the net result of all of this was the state is saving money and making money. Okay, but it didn't stop there. Remember, this is continuous improvement. All right, what was next? Next was interesting. I love this. Is now that they have the first two problems solved, the cars, the um, decommissioning, now they've got the capacity because they've gotten so efficient, they brought the wire harnesses in-house. They started making them in the garage. Why? because what it did was it gave them more flexibility because they're trying new things and they're trying to improve this and that and they're moving this and that and making it better. And every time they do, guess what? The wires are the long length. And so working with the supplier to change all these wire, the wire harnesses or to experiment wasn't working well. So what they were doing is they were splicing and, and wires to, to extend them or they were coiling them up and all kinds of problems. Well, now they brought it in-house and they turned that continuous improvement energy onto making wire harnesses. And the net result is what they did is they created an environment where it was easier to test things, easier to try experiments, easier to um, uh, um, change the wire harness design if they wanted a permanent change without having to work through a third party and drawings and coordination and all that sort of stuff. Plus, they saved about four to $500 a car. A vehicle on the conversion cost. Now, do you think it stopped there? Of course it did. It's go, it, they've become, they've gone from a problem to a benchmark in how to convert standard vehicles, factory fresh vehicles to police vehicles. They are now one of the global standards in that. Okay, let's step back a little bit. Can small ideas really transform an organization? Well, we look at the garage. We looked at Denver licensing. You can see that it's there, but the question is why? Well, small ideas have some advantages. The governor was pointing this out. You know, they wanted the small ideas. Why? Because they're quick and easy to implement. Quick and easy to implement. Do we need a lot of? Do we need a lot of uh, 
permission. Maybe that most are immediate boss and talking to the people that are also going to be using that change. And they're very low risk. What happens if it fails? What happens if one of our ideas fails? Well, the answer is we just untry it. We just plug it out, put another one in. Who's going to know the difference except the people working on the process itself? The other thing is anyone can come up with them. They don't need permission and resources to implement and they fly under the radar. What do I mean by flying under the radar? What I mean by flying under the radar is they, there's nobody in the big, uh, in the bureaucracy, no, none of the bosses see it, none, none of the other departments see it, so nobody has a vested interest in, uh, which is what happens when you try for bigger ideas, when you make bigger changes. You know, you, you, you're always running into somebody who doesn't want to change. Here, nice, fast, slow. Now, the question is, let's dig into this a little bit deeper. Small ideas might be tiny. You know, just a little idea, saves five minutes, right? But how many times a day? But they can have a surprisingly large punch. Let's look at an example. This is an example from Denver Licensing. One of the things Denver Licensing did for a lot of their different licenses, you had to do background check for a security license, for a liquor license, for uh, a lot of things, you had to have a criminal background check. So they had a computer set up, set up for um, licensees, people that were looking for licenses to sit down at the computer in the lobby and uh, do their own background checks, then print them out, bring them up. Well, the problem was the software was pretty convoluted. It was technical specialty software. And people were getting confused. So what would happen is they would get up, they would go, they would interrupt one of the licensed technicians, the licensed technician would have to help them. This is happening 36 times a day. You know, each one was only five minute interruption and then a little bit of time readjusting and stuff like that to come back to your work. But five minutes a day, 36 times. So what a bunch of the technicians came up with, three of the technicians came up with the idea, let's make our own manual. Manual was screenshots with arrows. You know, press here next, do this next, fill this in, you know, nice and easy so anyone could walk through it, walk through it. What was the result? It saved five minutes, 36 times a day. Hey, all of a sudden, five minutes is started at 36 times. But you got to remember, you look at this throughout a year, it's 750 hours per year. That's a third of a person. I was talking to... Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a director from uh, the state of Colorado in one of their departments, and he looked at this example and says, you know, that's a $100,000 idea. Because if you look at the cost of a person fully loaded, all their expenses, all their, 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 their overhead, everything, it comes to close to $100,000 a year. And so in three years, you save $100,000 worth of money. One little idea. And a lot of ideas that are repeated many times on the front line are exactly like this. So small ideas, this tiny idea, can be huge, can be huge. The other thing is the sheer quantity of small ideas frontline people can come up with can accumulate into enormous advantage. One of our favorite examples of this comes from ADOT, uh, Arizona Department of Transportation, their 51st Avenue uh, MVP service center. This was the bane of MVP, MVD. People, it took so long to get served that people would bring their grandparents in that they were looking after, their dogs, their kids. They'd bring in uh, 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 all sorts of media, boom boxes, you name it, because the wait was so long. And it was extremely confusing for a lot of reasons. But what they did is, what that unit did is, they started the Arizona, they, when, the, when the Arizona management system, which is essentially their Arizona's lead system, uh, uh, developed by uh, Governor Ducey, Ducey, which gives you a point of reference. What's the difference between Governor Inslee and Governor Ducey? One's a Democrat, one's a Republican. What this shows is this is totally agnostic when it comes to politics. It is, it is doesn't matter. In our study, the high performers came from as many 
many uh, Democratic as Republican uh, constituencies. Anyways, uh, what, what they were doing is they came up with the people at the on the front lines were getting 12 ideas implemented per year, per person. That's one a month. Not huge. You can come up with, all of you can come up with one good little idea per month, can't you? But what it did was it moved customer wait time from an average of 73 minutes with peaks of three hours down to the point where 75% of people were served within 15 minutes. That was their goal. So they could come in over lunch, get served and get back to work. And they achieved that. They achieved that, but through lots and lots of small ideas. Okay, small incremental ideas can also are also the key to improving and creating an institutional culture of improvement. You're just accustomed to, everyone just becomes accustomed to, and because you're accustomed to small changes, when bigger changes come, you can make the small changes to make those bigger changes more important, and it's just a whole lot easier. Okay, we've talked about small ideas. I want to share a second, second finding we had. Well, one more just for fun. I hope I hope I'm not dating myself with Rodney Dangerfield. But one of the things Rodney Dangerfield talked about was I get no respect. That was part of his shtick. He's a comic. And the problem is small ideas get no respect. Why? They're under the radar screen. Who sees them? Who sees them? You have a small improvement besides you and maybe your teammates. What happens? Nobody outside the organization sees it. It just makes it. It's part of that. It's part of that invisible excellence that the governor mentioned. That's that's what it is. Just this little thing, but nobody sees it. It gets no respect. Even even the people that came up with the ideas after a few months, it's just a regular way of doing work. So all the big bosses, when they come into the department, see is all they see is a well-run department. They don't see all of these little changes. So they get no respect, but they're so powerful. They're so powerful. Second finding I want to share, we had a lot of findings, but this, this one, I picked three to share with you. This is you need a spectrum of improvement tools and techniques to address, address all the different types of problems that, that any organization has. Okay, So it's not just lean. It's not just frontline ideas. It's a whole plethora of tools. Now, I won't I, and, and you're going to learn a lot of those tools this week uh, during the conference. And that's the exciting thing is look at these tools, consider them, and where can you use them? And when can you use them? Okay, let's look at what we found in general. In general, we found there's three sort of generic levels of improvement uh, tools that are needed. First, you need approved, uh, approaches that handle large numbers of small frontline ideas quickly and efficiently. You don't want management to have to approve these, uh, approve these things. Management isn't close, they don't know what's going on. Who's the best people to make the decision on whether a frontline, a small frontline idea makes sense? The people on the frontline doing it. So you need a process to make those decisions quickly, try them, if they don't work, throw them out, try something else. Point is, we need a quick thing. A lot of things here, it could be a, a, um, an idea board, uh, sometimes called a Kaizen board, uh, a huddle board, uh, sometimes just a, a, a regular meeting to discuss problems and come up with ideas. Very simple. We'll get into that in a little bit. Second thing you need is some medium-sized process problems that require coordination. Here, 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 the critical thing is getting the right people in the room with enough time and enough resources to solve it. Not real compliment, complicated. Sometimes this is where your, uh, your, your, your lean stuff falls, or Six Sigma falls in here. Also rapid improvement uh, events, a lot of different tools fall in here. They're just to improve a process. And lastly, you need approaches that handle large, complex, cross-cultural or cross-unit uh, uh, issues, complex systems level issues. And running those programs are, uh, it's more like a campaign that involves all of the others at the same time. The other thing that is most interesting is all of these have to work in concert. Because when you have a large complex problem, it's got a lot of little components 
that have are some of which are just do it, some of which require a little study. So they all have to work together. One of the ways to do that, we found, oh, quick example before we get there. One of our favorite examples in different levels is coming from uh, New Brunswick. New Brunswick has a great system. Uh, they just call it the formal management system, and it has five, six different levels. The, the two lowest levels, daily management and waste walks are frontline levels. Daily management, you can just imagine, you know, what are we doing today? What happened yesterday? How can we fix it? Ideas right there on the spot, just do it. Waste walks, a little more effort, a little more thought on the front lines. Then, then they use rapid improvement, Lean Six Sigma for those mid-level things. For the high level, they use value stream mapping and deliverology. Deliverology um, was uh, uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair's uh, program, large, huge changes in whole areas of uh, uh, like, like, like education or healthcare. It's projects at that level. Third finding, the interesting thing, this was an interesting thing, the highest performing companies, what they are uh, units, government units, what they did is they would pull their frontline people into larger level teams. When they had a larger problem, they'd always make sure to have frontline level people there. Reason for this is the people on the front line have a unique knowledge of time and place, according to um, technical term, but they know how things are actually done. They know how to fix them. They know whether an idea is going to work. And to have them on those higher level teams solving bigger cross-functional problems is important for that reality check. It's also important for implementation because the people on the front line have already had their voice, so they've been represented, and they know how things are actually going to get done. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here and 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 finish off with 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 a with a straightforward thing that we found out is how do you, as a frontline leader, get started if you're not already doing this? What the governor said is take one thing away and try it. Try it. Well, what we've got is if you're a frontline leader, you've got a team of you know, six, eight, 10 people, and you want to start this, or even three people, um, first of all, develop a shared vision with measured goals. A shared vision, that's everything. Let's look at our two examples. Our two examples were, again, Denver licensing. What was the problem there in the shared vision? Get rid of those lines. Get rid of those lines. Nice, clear, shared vision. Everyone can believe in it. Everyone was suffering from it. You're dealing with angry employees or angry customers. You, you, you want to deal with it. That's their vision. What was the Washington State Patrol's garage's vision? Get those cars down to 110,000 miles, produce more, convert more per month. So very straightforward goals that everyone can agree on. Secondly, a simple system to capture it. Could be a whiteboard, could be a flip chart, could be just about anything. Uh, my first one actually years and years ago, over, over uh, almost 40 years ago, gosh, it's that long, um, was actually using a piece of welder's chalk on a, on a cinder block wall, a gray cinder block wall in a foundry. That's how I started my first simple idea improvement process. Okay. Simple system, capture it, capture it and follow through on it. You got to make sure to follow through on it. Develop a team with good, of good problem solvers. How do you do that? If you can take advantage of some training and lean and continuous improvement and uh, these sort of things, do it. If not, read some good books, uh, visit some things online and coach your people. I mean, people have ideas. People have ideas already. Where do you start? Where do you start? What's bugging them? What's bugging you? You just ask them, what's bugging you? What's harder than it should be? And just don't let them blame the other people in the other unit. What can we do it with little ideas? We don't have to solve it all at once. We don't have to invest you know, $30,000 in a new system. What are the little things we can do for less than 50 bucks? Okay. Lastly, make improvement part of everyone's job. How do you do that? You can have a simple meeting every morning, a kickoff, a huddle, say, okay, um, how things go yesterday? 
what needs to be improved, what are we doing today, and come up with ideas, any ideas on how to do what we're doing better. Just some sort of regular daily or weekly meeting, making it part of everyone's job, and then turn around and make it part of the annual review. All right. One last thought. This is coming from Margaret Mead, famous uh, anthropologist and author. Never underestimate the power of a small group of committed people to change the world. We may not be changing the world, but I can guarantee you can change your corner of government and make your corner of government excellent. And you know what? It makes for a much better place to work. One of the interesting findings coming out of Denver licensing is their annual turnover went from 30% to practically nothing as those lines disappeared. Why? It was a better place to work. They were being asked for their ideas. Any of us having problems maintaining and attracting people today? It's a great way to do it. Well, I appreciate it. Now, I'd encourage you, as the governor said, and as Mandeep said, pick one thing today, this week, uh, the, during the conference, one or two things, and try them. Now, because we haven't had chance for uh, a chance for questions, what I do, I've got is up now is my um, email number, dean.schroeder at valpo.edu. Uh, my website, dmschroeder.com. I encourage you, if you've got any questions, Shoot me an email. I guarantee I'll get back to you and answer them. And the tougher the question, the tougher the problem, the better. If it's a real tough one, we have to maybe have to make a Zoom session out of it. But uh, I encourage you, if you've got anything, just ask. Mandeep, I hope Thank that's you. that's fine for you. Yeah. Thank you it's been so real much. Clever. Sure. Yeah, thank you so much. That, that was amazing. What you have shared with us today demonstrate the importance of lean and continuous improvement and what it takes from us all, from the front line to senior leaders and to further a culture of continuous improvement in the state government and for the people we serve. Uh, thank you for sharing your expertise and time with us today, uh, Dr. Schroeder. Uh, I also want to thank you, Governor Inslee, again for being with us today and for his continued support. And thank you to all of our amazing attendees who have given their time to be with us today and part of this collective learning experience. Uh, please take the time to complete the survey and that will pop up at the end of this session. This will provide us with a meaningful feedback about your meeting experience. We also would like to keep this learning going. In order to do that, we invite everyone to sign up for Results Washington Continuous Improvement Community of Practice. This community of practice is an amazing opportunity to get to know and learn from continuous improvement practitioners across the state. A link to sign up for that community of practice will be shared in the chat and for each session as well. With that, enjoy the conference. Thank you.